Hello everybody and welcome back to Oxygen Not Included. Today we're going to be taking a quick look at all of the power generation, storage, and transmission options in the game. That's the generators, the batteries, the wires, the transformers, all that good stuff. Kind of explaining the role of each of these things, the pros and cons of each of the different power generation options. Uh, giving you an idea how to set up these systems and just kind of overall going sort of quick pass is this technology good at what stage of the game is it good and what are, under what conditions is it good that sort of thing just so you have a general idea of a uh, power system for your base and what's good and what's not and a bit of a disclaimer before i start the video even though I'm, i am recording this video just two days before the game releases there is a good chance that either now between now and release or after release clay is going to rebalance a lot of things in the game power might be one of them and so uh, before you take everything in this video at face value, especially if it's been like a year or something, if you're watching this video a year in the future, check the description because I'm gonna try and keep current sort of patch notes in the description. Uh, so if anything's changed significantly from what I'm describing today, like if a technology's kind of gone from good to bad or vice versa, I'll, I'll make sure to include that in the description and kind of keep that updated over time. But um, you know, with that sort of disclaimer out of the way, let's get to the power generation technology. So. We start off the game with manual generators and small batteries and basic wires. And these are all pretty limited, um, especially the manual generator. The manual generator is just sort of a building that you build at the start so you can power your early game research to inevitably research something better. Because the major downside of the manual generator is that it requires a duplicate to operate it. Um, and duplicates are pretty precious creatures. Right here I've got Ari, uh, he's struggling to breathe because I've spawned him in a vacuum. Um, but to take an entire duplicant, which consumes oxygen and food and requires the use of all sorts of facilities and has stress and morale to manage, to take that guy and just turn him into a 400 watt generator is kind of wasteful in the long run, right? That your base might only be 12 duplicates. If, if half of them are running on wheels, then your, your progress in the game is gonna be rather slow, right? And because a lot of uh, the speed at which you run out of resources is tied to how many duplicates you have, uh, it usually just isn't worth it in the long run, particularly to have duplicates running on manual generators. One of the big advantages of manual generators in the late game is that um, duplicates will gain skills faster if they're doing something, and a manual generator is just an easy way to occupy them very easily, so that way they're always just you know running on a manual generator, they're never idle or doing something like that. But other than that, the manual generator is gonna be something that you kind of strictly limit to the early game. And in that context, in that early game, when you have duplicates just able to run around, right? And don't have to worry about a lot of the other pressing things happening in the late game and mid game, the challenges that'll kind of come down the pipe at you in terms of running out of water, running out of food, running out of all this stuff. Um, the manual generator is pretty efficient. It's 400 watts of power for a duplicate running on it. Um, 400 watts is sufficient to power usually three buildings right? Um, research stations and a lot of your early game stuff will only take 120 watts. So a duplicate running on a manual generator um, for most of the day, right? Because they're going to take a break at some point to go and sleep and eat and all that stuff. But a duplicate kind of devoted to a manual generator is going to be able to power most of your early game stuff pretty easily. And the way that you want to build almost all power systems and your early game systems included is you want to have your generator connected to a battery and then that battery connected to whatever your power consumers are. Here I've just slapped down a refrigerator as an example. So if I look at the power overlay here, I have a wire just connecting all of these up. And the reason you want to do this this way for most of your power systems is that uh, your wires have a max wattage. The basic wire that you start off with has a max wattage of 1000 watts. And uh, this means that if you have more than 1000 watts of consumption, occurring uh, across your, your grid, the wires will, uh, random wires across that grid will start to take damage. And one of the sort of problems that you can have is that if you have um, your, sort of your control over that consumption um, done by generators, just limiting the number of generators that you put on the system, um, you, know, so you aren't supplying more power than, than necessary. Uh, one of the problems you can have is that if you know, this battery was connected from one end and generators connected from another, you might have a scenario where the battery is discharging and adding its power to the system and the generators are running and you could overload your wire. So most systems are going to have batteries in between the generating technology and whatever the consuming technology is. With that in mind, one thing to note about uh, the way that the game calculates whether or not a grid, a particular sort of energy grid is overloaded, right? If it's running more power than, than it can, is it's going to look at only the power consumption at the end of the day. 
Um, so as long as you limit your grid to just under the amount of um, consumption that would be necessary to overload the wire, then you can really have any amount of power generation on that. And we'll look at sort of ways that you can uh, deal with that and abuse that in the future. But that is something important to consider. The game looks at consumption on the power grid when it decides whether or not there is some sort of power overload. Um, and that's also part of the reason why this system uh, works pretty well. Of course, I also have a similar system down here where I've taken the wire and gone ahead and put it underground, um, sort of put it inside this tile. One of the advantages of that is that these wires have a negative decor bonus oftentimes. If I go to power, wire, uh, a decor effect of minus five with a radius of one tile. Um, by sticking your wires in sort of out of the way places as opposed to just running across uh, you know, the, the places where your duplicates are gonna be, you can limit the sort of the decor malice that a lot of duplicates will suffer. This isn't strictly necessary though. It's pretty easy to keep your morale up in the game. Decor is not a major factor. So if you just wanna save on materials, you can do this. But a lot of people just like the neat look of putting everything inside tiles. That's one option. Wires uh, also have the ability to go through walls, which is very important in order to do this. We'll see that some technologies later will require, will, will require special plates, special tiles to go through walls that that tile will effectively form the wall. And we'll get to that in a bit. So Mano Generators, really strong early game, um, decent in like mid to late game if you just want your duplicates to not be idle and you want them to sort of accumulate skills, but very quickly they become obsolete and they're not something you want to stick to for a long period of time. There is something to note about the batteries though. Um, a small battery can contain 10 kilojoules of power and will lose that power at a rate of one and two thirds watts. So this battery is going to bleed off power over time when it has power in it. Um, that's something to keep in mind. Electricity you generate slowly dissipates from this battery and is more or less lost as heat energy. So a small battery will produce 1.25 kilo DTUs of heat uh, per second. And that's even more than the manual generator produces itself. So um, when comparing batteries, keep those numbers in mind. It stores 10 kilojoules, it leaks one and two thirds watts, and it uh, produces 1.25 kilo DTUs of heat. In fact, let me just get the batteries out of the way right now because there's only two more, two more batteries. The jumbo battery stores four times as much power, but generates only the same amount of heat as the battery. The trick to it is that it loses twice as much uh, power over time. So the power leakage from the jumbo battery is twice that of the normal battery. Um, so a lot of people like just sort of upgrading from batteries, these sort of normal sized batteries to jumbo batteries, but that's not always sort of the right thing because you're losing in effect um, twice as much power to the battery and you're not really gaining anything in terms of heat. You're getting four times the storage, which is nice, uh, but storage might not be super relevant, particularly if you've moved away from manual generators, storage becomes a lot less relevant of a, uh, a consideration. Any amount of storage is really gonna be fine for a lot of these systems uh, going forward. So um, tiny batteries, right? These little batteries are perfectly fine. You can stick with them for a long time. Um, they're not gonna have as much storage potential as one of these batteries, but they're gonna leak less power and they generate the same amount of heat. So they're pretty good. Um, next up is the smart battery. And the main advantage of the smart battery is that you can link it up to other power structures and tell those structures to turn off if the battery is full. So once the battery is full or reaches some threshold, you can set what the high threshold is. This is the point where it sends a signal, okay, I want these buildings to uh, turn off. The low threshold is the point where you say, okay, I want these buildings to turn on, right? So if I had some coal generator that was stopped, this is the point where it turned back on. Right now it's at 100 these are the default numbers. So Right, if the battery's full, turns off all the power stuff. If the battery then empties, turns back on the power stuff. Um, the big advantage is that this can save you a lot of fuel, right? The big advantage of the smart batteries is they save you a ton of fuel over the long run because you don't have your buildings just constantly running even if there is no use for that power, right? And so smart batteries are a really important technology to get your hands on very quickly. The big problem with them is if we go to power, um, a battery is just going to use normal metals, right? So copper ore, stuff like that. A smart battery requires refined metals. So instead of copper ore, we need refined copper. Refined metals are a difficult resource to obtain. Um, so that's gonna be a little bit of a tricky thing, right? You're not gonna have immediate access to these things in the early game. Even after you've researched them, you're probably gonna need to go out and find some refined metals somewhere in order to build these systems. You also need to build an automation wire 
right? So here, if we go to the automation view, I have uh, the battery's sort of signal output uh, station block tile, whatever we want to call this, its port. Um, its output port is linked up to the uh, power generating structures that are connected to it, right, by wire. And it will send that signal, turn off when I'm full, turn back on when I'm empty, or whatever you set uh, these smart battery values to, right? So this smart battery um, can save you a lot of fuel in the long run. It does require that investment of refined metal, enough to make the battery and link up whatever your systems are, but is very, very potent and sort of the core of a lot of power systems. So that's the main advantage. It also has other advantages though, which is that it produces only 0.5 kilo DTUs of heat. That's less than half of what either of these batteries do. And uh, while it doesn't quite have as much uh, storage capacity as the jumbo battery, the smart battery only has uh, 20 kilojoules while this one is 40, it's still double that of the normal battery, right? Um, this is 10 kilojoules, this is 20 kilojoules. And as I mentioned before, storage capacity isn't the most important thing in the game. Um, usually it's sort of the efficiency of the system that matters the most. And because of this uh, feature of the smart batteries that they can turn off systems when they're no longer needed, when they no longer need to be running, um, that's usually going to be the most efficient thing that you can get. They also, because they produce less heat, are very efficient. And also they only leak uh, two thirds of a watt as opposed to the one and two thirds of a watt of the small battery or the three and one thirds of a watt of the jumbo batteries. So they're efficient in power, efficient in heat, efficient in fuel usage. The big trick is that they require refined metals. So that's going over sort of all your battery options there. Let's continue on with the, um, the power generation options. Next up is the wood burner. This building is pretty terrible. There are very few situations in which you want to use it. And, and really the situations in which you want to use it are ones where um, you don't even really care about the power. So the wood burner, requires uh, 1200 grams per second so 1.2 kilograms per second of lumber and produces 17 or sorry 170 grams per second of carbon dioxide it only produces 300 watts of power which is less than a manual generator um, and also it produces nine kilo DTUs of heat that's nine times what the manual generator produces for for less power than what the manual generator produces so this is pretty terrible, uh, and particularly when you consider how much lumber we're talking about. Um, a given tree, if it's domesticated and you're growing it, you're actively growing it, it's not just some wild growing tree, is going to produce um, 333 kilograms of lumber per cycle, uh, or 555 grams per second of lumber on average, right? Obviously it's gonna be doing it in batches, you're gonna, the tree is gonna grow, you're gonna harvest it, you're gonna wait for the new tree to grow, um, but, 550 grams per second per tree, per domesticated tree, uh, that means that you could have two trees and still not be able to run consistently a single wood burner. That, that wood burner would still need to turn off every once in a while to keep up with your your uh, your wood production, right? So, oy, that's a, a really big cost, especially when you consider how badly trees have been nerfed recently. Um, a tree requires 70 kilograms of polluted water per cycle, 10 kilograms of dirt per cycle, assuming you're domesticating it and, and sort of growing it intentionally. Um, that's a lot of resources. Water is an incredibly important resource in, in this game. Polluted water, no exception. Um, dirt is also kind of useful. So this is a lot of resources to get very little power out. This is also a lot of duplicate labor that you're ultimately going to need to power the system because the duplicate, duplicate is going to need to go down, harvest the tree's branches, and then deliver them to the wood burner. So you're almost not even really saving on duplicate labor, right, compared to the manual generator. And this is only 300 watts. It's, it's three quarters that of the manual generator. This technology is really bad. It does have a sort of niche use, though, which is that um, it produces, and this is gonna sound weird, but it produces 170 grams per second of carbon dioxide, which is a lot of carbon dioxide. Um, the main advantage of this, honestly, is that it produces this carbon dioxide because there are gonna be some maps, the forest maps in particular, where you're going to have access to a, a plant called oxyferns. Uh, these oxyferns will turn carbon dioxide into oxygen and uh, as a result, having some of these wood burners, just so you can kind of keep a steady flow of carbon dioxide coming out is going to be something you want to do to, to, in order to oxygenate your base, right? You're going to take wherever these oxyferns are, you're going to want to stick something like a wood burner next to them and make sure that they're flush with CO2 to turn into oxygen for you. Um, because there aren't really a lot of easy ways to produce CO2 early on. Uh, we're going to see that a lot of these other technologies don't even really produce as much CO2 as the wood burner. 
And duplicants themselves don't really produce that much CO2 either. Um, this guy is suffocating because I spawned him in a vacuum, but normally this would say that he's producing two grams per second of CO2 and inhaling uh, 100 grams per second of oxygen. So two grams per second, right? Two grams per second is what this guy would exhale. Um, this thing right here is producing the same amount of CO2 as 85 duplicants, which is insane. Um, so something to keep in mind, this does have some value as a CO2 producing machine. Uh, if your base wants CO2, this is a great way to produce it. But other than that, this is pretty poor as a technology. Um, it's, it's really just a CO2 generator, not really a power structure. Um, I think that's sort of the way it should be considered. Next up, we have one of the best, if not the best power technologies in the game, which is the coal generator. Um, the coal generator, uh, this is a little bit uh, not helpful. Let's go to the building uh, tab over here. The coal generator consumes 1,000 grams per second of coal. It produces 600 watts of power, so 50% more than the manual generator does and twice what the wood, bur wood burner does. It produces 20 grams per second of carbon dioxide, which uh, is still a decent amount. It's obviously less than 170 grams per second that the wood burner was putting out. Um, and it does produce a pretty good amount of heat. It produces the same amount as the wood generator, which is nine kilodetus per second. So this does start to sort of tax you in terms of your heat budget. Um, your base will slowly warm up as you use these, but this isn't the biggest of deals, especially early on. And late game, you'll start sort of coming up with solutions to the heat problems. Um, and this is just a really, really efficient system, particularly when paired up with a smart battery. Um, smart battery will make sure that the system economizes on its use of coal and uh, 1,000 grams per second of coal is not a lot. One, 1,200 grams per second of lumber was a lot because you only had one way to really acquire lumber, that was trees. Those trees require water and dirt to grow, unless they're growing wild, in which case you just need a ton of trees. It's really, really hard to scale up a wood burner system, uh, but for coal generators, you're going to find large veins of coal on most asteroids that you colonize, uh, and you can just mine these out and boom, there's all your fuel, right? One duplicate comes by, and he finds a tile of coal which has 2,000 kilograms on it, and boom, you've, you've suddenly supplied a coal generator for a long period of time. In addition to that, the sort of renewability of coal is a lot better than that of lumber. Um, if The main option is hatches. Hatches will eat stuff, and depending upon what type of hatch you're using, they'll eat different things, and they will produce a single hatch uh, in sort of the right environment will produce as much coal as necessary to constantly run a coal generator. Um, that just one of these will produce 600 kilograms of coal per cycle uh, with a cycle of 600 seconds. So uh, one of these can supply a coal generator and it's not hard to keep one of these hatches uh, sort of busy. In fact, um, the fact that hatches can be harvested for meat and other useful things makes them a, a really good choice for your sort of long-term power options. They, these can be the guys that produce a lot of your coal. Um, I recommend going with stone hatches if you choose to ra ranch hatches for their coal because stone hatches will eat pretty much a bunch of stuff you don't care about, igneous rock being the, one of the big ones, um, sedimentary rock, obsidian, granite, etc. So you kind of want to breed stone hatches if possible. Normal hatches are fine too. Um, they won't eat some of the stuff that you really don't care about like igneous rock. They're going to be going for things that are a little bit more limited, um, but sand is in particular one of the good things to feed them, right? That's a, a pretty easy one to, to give to them. Sedimentary rock is also one of the things that you really don't care about. You don't really want to be feeding them food. Um, food is not a good thing to feed them because they will produce a lot less coal if they're fed food. They'll also turn into sage hatches if you feed them food, um, which will then pretty much eat only food and uh, will just be really bad at producing coal in general. So um, stone hatches are probably the way to go for, for renewing that. But uh, the great thing about coal generators is you're probably on most maps just gonna have access to tons and tons of coal. You're gonna have a very long time before you need to sort of settle whether or not you want to either start up a hatch ranch or move to some other power option, especially if you're using smart batteries in conjunction with that. Um, if you're just running a coal generator constantly, that's bad but you're gonna find refined metals pretty soon after you find coal. So this is not just a great mid-game technology, but I've seen bases that basically continue using coal generators all the way to the late game because they go pretty hard into hatch ranching and they have enough hatches to support that system. Uh, so coal generator, definitely worth it, definitely very strong, um, excellent building, and uh, I highly recommend it, in particular combined with a smart battery. 
Next up, we have the hydrogen generator. A lot of expert players, a lot of kind of high-level players, people who are more veteran of the game, it's kind of difficult to say what a high-level player is. This is a single-player game, after all. Um, but a lot of expert players, a lot of veteran players, will say that the hydrogen, hydrogen generator is a trap that, um, even though it is a really nice power option in a lot of regards, let's go to the hydrogen generator here, produces 800 watts of power, right? So we're up, up to twice what a manual generator will produce. It only produces four kilo DTUs per second uh, of heat, which is less than half that of the coal generator, even though the coal generator produces, produces less power, right? Um, and has no waste outputs, right? It just consumes 100 grams per second of hydrogen, pretty small, and outputs a ton of power. Um, even though this hydrogen generator looks really efficient and really cool, a lot of players will say it's a trap because they say that the, the best use of hydrogen is uh, as rocket fuel, right? You want to liquefy that hydrogen, put it in a rocket, and that's going to be what powers your space program. And every uh, bit of hydrogen that you run through this hydrogen generator is 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 in a lost opportunity, right? Because the only real way you have to generate that hydrogen is with the electrolyzer, and the electrolyzer requires water in order to to run and water is one of the more precious resources in the game it's kind of hard to get your hands on a lot of water and sort of as a result they say look um you know late game you want a ton of hydrogen and uh if you haven't been saving up your hydrogen you're going to find yourself not having enough water to power as big a space program as you want and therefore you shouldn't use the hydrogen generator but i think for newer players and even for experienced players i i still think the hydrogen generator is good i'm going to give it my thumbs up this is a technology you should use because it is just so easy to set up a hydrogen generator alongside an electrolyzer electrolyzer produces 112 grams per second of hydrogen um, which is just a little bit more than what the hydrogen generator takes and if you combine that with an anti-entropy thermal nullifier which is a building you can find around the map sometimes, the anti-entropy thermal nullifier will cool down things for only 10 grams per second of hydrogen. So basically, if you run an electrolyzer more or less full time, um, you can power that electrolyzer and all the pumps and everything else associated with that sort of electrolysis room to get oxygen going one way and hydrogen going another and so on and so forth. You can power all that with a hydrogen generator and have just enough hydrogen left over to feed into an anti-entropy thermonullifier to make sure that the oxygen that you're pumping out is all nice and cold. So there are some really neat very self-contained, very easy to set up systems that combine a hydrogen generator with an electrolyzer. And the alternative, um, if you decide not to have sort of this self-powered oxygen module, as it's called, is to have some other power structure attached to it. Um, and that becomes kind of onerous because over time, you're just gonna have ever increasing amounts of hydrogen that you need to store for the eventual point at which you go to space. If you set up your electrolysis machines on, say, cycle 200, and you don't go to space till cycle 800, that's 600 cycles of just building uh, hydrogen storage after hydrogen storage after hydrogen storage. So I think this is still a good building. A lot of people will say otherwise, uh, but I think especially for newer players, this is just so efficient and so clean and allows you to build just really compact, easy, self-contained designs uh, that I think are just really fun to build and uh, uh, really neat to look at. So um, even if there is an argument that you should be saving every scrap of hydrogen you have, I don't think that's super relevant. In the late game, you're going to have access to so much stuff. You're going to find solutions to water shortages. You're going to find ways to generate the hydrogen you need, I think. And so I think this is still a good building. Next up comes the natural gas generator. Natural gas generator is one of the greatest buildings for producing power in the game, uh, largely because it produces one of the most important resources in the game, which is water. 90 grams per second of combustible gas goes in. Currently, this will not accept ethanol gas. It only accepts natural gas. I think they're gonna change this, so keep that in mind. Uh, but right now, it only accepts natural gas. But you send 90 grams per second of natural gas in, which is not a lot and you get 67.5 grams per second of polluted water out, and the rest of your input turns into carbon dioxide. So this is taking 90 grams per second of material and turning it into 90 grams per second of material. The carbon dioxide, not super useful. Um, you know, you can do things with it, but uh, the amount of water that you're getting is fantastic. And so you'll see a lot of builds which are designed to create natural gas and then use that natural gas to generate water. And they don't even really care if they're inefficient with their use of the power because the main goal is to get that ever precious resource, water. And this produces a lot of it given what you're putting in. So 
Um, this is a really strong technology. Heat generation rate is pretty big, 10 kilo DTUs per second, right? This is comparable to a coal generator. Power is kind of comparable as well, 800 watts, more than the 600 watts, but whatever. Um, you can combine these with smart batteries, just like you do with coal generators to be a little bit more efficient on that. And same thing with the, all the power technologies, basically, except for nano generators, which kind of already have their own sort of smart battery built in. Um, but yeah, this is just one of the premier power generation buildings. You'll see a lot of uh, players in the late game go entirely to natural gas generators just because they want to maximize how much water they, they're able to produce. And uh, a lot of that comes down to the ways of generating natural gas in the game and how sort of little water or little resources they might take. So oil refineries. Um, oil refineries are not a great technology to be using in the ultra light game because there are more efficient things that you can build, um, but they're a very straightforward way to uh, turn oil into petroleum. And they will also generate natural gas. This natural gas will just kind of off put to the area around it. And then you can take an air pump and pump it into a natural gas generator. Um, the oil refinery will produce exactly as much natural gas as a natural gas generator consumes. So you can kind of have your oil refinery linked up on a closed system where it is powered by a natural gas generator, which is just taking the um, natural gas from the room that you have the oil refinery in. Do note, if we go to ventilation, um, there is no, there's of course an input port here on this hydrogen generator for where you can send hydrogen in. There is no output port for the natural gas on this oil refinery. It's just going to be released to the area around it. So you are going to need to build a pump to pump that natural gas into your um, natural gas generator, right? But you can have a self-contained system that, that still works, right? Uh, using natural gas generators. Um, the power requirements of this oil refinery are 480 watts. A pump would take you another 240 watts, right? Which you, you wouldn't even need to run it all the time because a pump can uh, handle 1,000 grams per second, which is more than 90 grams per second. So it would only be running partially as well. So you can power that sort of um, oil refinery system just using the natural gas that it generates, which is pretty neat. Uh, kind of the same way that hydrogen generators and electrolyzers just pair really well together. These pair really well together as well. Um, you also have other sort of generation options for producing this natural gas. Fertilizer synthesis will produce some natural gas. This used to be an infinite loop way back in the day. Now it isn't. I don't really recommend producing fertilizer, so I don't really have you know a lot of comments on whether or not this is a good thing to pair with a natural gas generator. It's just not a really efficient building to use in general. But if you are using something that requires fertilizer, then sure, might as well get the natural gas from this. Flatulent dupes will also produce natural gas. I don't re recommend taking on many flatulent dupes because they're really annoying to, to, to get the natural gas from. Um, but that is also an option for you. But uh, there's also, sorry, one other thing before I get to the big one. Um, there are also gassy moves. These are creatures that you can grab from space. You'll take a rocket to space, go to the, sort of the, the gassy moo planet and bring back some of these, these giant space cows. Um, they will float around and eat gas grass, which is a plant that you can also bring back from their planet. Um, this is a really complicated setup in order to get your natural gas, but it is one of the avenues available to you. The big one though, is condensation of natural, uh, is not natural gas, condensation of sour gas. If you take sour gas, and you condense it down at negative 161.5 degrees Celsius, you will get methane and sulfur. And the methane can then uh, evaporate or boil off into natural gas. And so you can take sour gas, which is produced just by heating up petroleum, or which is also just heated, produced by heating up crude oil, right? So you heat up crude oil, it turns into petroleum, heat up petroleum, it turns into sour gas. You can just take your oil supplies and instead of running them through a oil refinery, you can heat them up, turn them into sour gas, and then cool that sour gas down, um, turn it into methane. There's, there's a lot of builds out there for how you can do this. I have one on the, the channel, um, and this is a really efficient system, and overall will net you a lot of water uh, using the system, because oil is something you can generate from uh, oil wells by pumping in water. You get water from the natural gas generator. It's a sort of virtuous loop. You get more water uh, from the system than you, you put in. Um, really powerful late game technology, something that a lot of people are going to want to use in their bases. In the early game and mid game, you're probably limited in terms of your natural gas generators to either pairing them with an oil refinery if you've reached the oil biome or using them in conjunction with a uh, natural gas vent. There'll be various vents that produce a natural gas, kind of like there are vents that produce hydrogen gas as well. You're, I think you're guaranteed one on every map, 
I'm not sure if that's still the case. They've changed a lot of the options in terms of how maps generate these days. Um, but natural gas gener uh, generators can be run off of these vents, and that's a pretty good option. Do keep in mind, though, a couple things. One is that while this natural gas produces polluted water, there is no output port for that polluted water. It's just going to drop on the ground, right? So you're going to have to have some sort of like mesh tile beneath this where the water drops into some area where you can collect it or something along those lines. It's not just going to go into a pipe nice and easy for you. Um, interestingly, though, there is an output port right you can attach a pipe to for carbon dioxide so the carbon dioxide will go out very neatly in a pipe uh, which is kind of neat because the carbon dioxide will usually come out at a temperature that's good for slicksters um, and so you can just put, put this straight to a slickster farm later on but you can sort of control the carbon dioxide you can't control the polluted water that comes out of the system um, just keep that in mind you're probably going to have mesh tile underneath these and a sort of water collection area with the pump underneath it to collect that water send it off to wherever you want to put it um, but natural gas generators, one of the premier options, one of the best options you have for power generation in the game because they generate water and water is so important. Next up is the petroleum generator. This used to be kind of a worse version of the natural gas generator. This is something you did before you developed your sort of sour gas condensation system if you're, or if you're just lazy. They're not bad. They're just a little bit less efficient than natural gas generators when running uh, things like petroleum. So this petroleum generator, let's go to power. You'll notice the power is a lot higher. Right, two kilowatts. This is 800 watts, this is 2,000 watts. Uh, so the petroleum generator is producing a lot more, but it requires not 90 grams per second of, of combustible gas, it requires 2,000 grams per second of combustible liquid. This building will accept ethanol, uh, unlike the, the natural gas building. Again, natural gas building, I expect a change in the future, so it will accept ethanol, but um, the change to accepting ethanol, the introduction of ethanol into the game, kind of really changed this building's fortunes because before, right, if we look at uh, how much carbon dioxide and polluted water it produces, this is fine, but it's not as good as the natural gas generator, right? The natural gas generator was producing a l much larger fraction of uh, its inputs as outputs. In fact, it was basically taking all 90 grams per second of the natural gas that was put into it and turning it into either carbon dioxide or polluted water. Here, we're not getting that. We're only getting 1,250 grams per second for 2,000 grams per second put in. Um, but also, the ratio is just worse for us. We care less about carbon dioxide than we do polluted water, right? We want more polluted water. We we'll care a little bit less about carbon dioxide. So this is not quite as good of a building. The major advantage of it right now, for the moment, again, I expect things to change, is that it can take in ethanol. And so this means that we have sort of a better use for the trees around our map and the lumber systems that we can set up. It does generate more heat. Um, this isn't that bad though, because again, this produces more than twice the power of a natural gas generator. So uh, even though most power buildings out there are gonna produce something like nine kilo DTUs per second, and this produces 20, um, it's producing two kilowatts of power, which is more than double what all these other things are doing. So this is just commensurate uh, with the, the increase. But let's talk a little bit about um, how you would fuel this thing. Oil refineries are an obvious option. Likewise, uh, boiling your crude oil into petroleum is a good option. Molten slicksters will produce uh, petroleum directly. Regular slicksters will produce crude oil, which again can be run through an oil refinery or heated up into petroleum. All those options work. I think the one that really makes this building stand out compared to the natural gas generator, again at the moment, is that it accepts ethanol. And they have put on a lot of nerfs to the ethanol distillery, um, but the ethanol distillery is still a pretty good building if you're using your trees in a wild growth format. If you're having your trees grown wild and so you don't have to put a lot of resources into growing those trees, this is a pretty efficient thing. So um, the ethanol distiller will take 1,000 grams per second of lumber. It'll use a little bit of power, 240 watts, and it'll produce 500 grams per second of ethanol and a lot of polluted dirt. Dirt is gonna be something you care a lot about in the future and some carbon dioxide, right? Carbon dioxide, again, you don't care that much about, but this ethanol will ultimately be converted into polluted water by running it through a uh, a petroleum uh, generator, right? So what does the math work out to on this? Well, if a single tree produces 555 grams per second of lumber under, under domesticated conditions, then you could basically have two trees powering a single ethanol distillery and four ethanol distilleries will power a uh, petroleum generator. And if you do the math for that, you're basically going to be taking about 900 grams per second of polluted water and turning it into 750 grams per second of polluted water. 
you'll get a lot of dirt at the deal, which is pretty good, right? Polluted dirt can be turned into dirt, and that dirt can be used to farm things. So that's a nice way of generating dirt, but it isn't what it was before, which is a way of generating an infinite amount of polluted water. You still can do that, uh, but you will need wild trees instead. And instead of having eight trees to support four distilleries to support a single petroleum generator, you're now going to need, in fact, um, you're going to need four times as many trees for that, right? So instead of eight trees, you're going to need 32 wild growing trees in order to support just a single petroleum generator. The big upside of it is that you will then be generating a lot of polluted water more or less for free. So this is still a good avenue for generating that polluted water, but it's just going to take more space, more setup, probably some amount of automation to make really efficient. Uh, all these sort of things are going to have to be things that you consider in setting up your system. It's not going to be one of these things that just suddenly in the mid game, as long as you're playing a forest map, boom, you have access to infinite power, infinite water, infinite everything. I did a video on the ethanol distillery when it was when it first came out. Um, a lot of the things in that video still stand true, but they only stand true now if you are growing the trees wildly and uh, right if you're just having uh, these uh, pips. Right, these little creatures right here, if you're having them run around and plant the trees for you and just let them grow um, under these wild conditions as opposed to domestic growth conditions, again, it's four times the life cycle, but you don't have to put in any of these resources. You don't have to spend any dirt or polluted water to make this thing grow. And so you're still able to generate a lot of polluted water for free. And as long as it's the case that this natural gas generator um, doesn't consume ethanol gas, then this does have an advantage over the natural gas generator because it can go down this pathway, right, of taking trees that you can potentially grow for free and turning them into polluted water, which is one of the, the important resources in the game. Next up, we have another sort of premier technology for uh, power generation, that is the steam turbine. The big thing about the steam turbine is it is the only power generating structure here that deletes heat. All the others are either, I think, heat neutral. I think the solar panel doesn't generate heat. Let me check just for a second. Um, yeah, solar panel does not generate heat, so it's heat neutral. But every single other one of these generates heat over time, right? You need to kind of do things if you want to cool down these systems. The steam turbine deletes heat. Now, it will generate Technically speaking, it will generate more heat than any of these other buildings. Uh, an operating steam turbine is going to generate about 80 kilo DTUs of heat per second. That's a lot. You're going to actually have to have a dedicated cooling system to keep these things cool, especially since they stop working above 100 degrees. I have a whole video discussing steam turbines and uh, aqua thermo uh, sorry, uh, thermal aqua tuners which you should probably check out if you want to learn a little bit more about the steam turbine. But the basics here is you need to keep it under 100 degrees. It's going to generate a lot of heat, but it's going to take steam as its fuel and output water, 95 degree water. It can accept up to two kilograms per second of steam and turn it into 95 degree water. And because you're taking that steam and turning it into water, right, there's a big temperature reduction that outweighs by far the amount of heat being generated by the steam turbine. And the heat generation rate of the steam turbine is proportional to how much heat you're deleting from that system. So roughly one-tenth of the heat you're deleting from that steam, removing, just turning it into water, uh, will be generated by the steam turbine. That's not a bad deal, especially since you can just have a system where um, the heat that you're generating in your steam turbine just gets dumped back into the system that is providing the steam for the steam turbine. There are, in fact, buildings that generate heat that are power positive with the steam turbine. The metal refinery, for example, generates more heat than the power it costs to, to run, right? So um, if you run this metal refinery, you'll generate a ton of heat. And if you uh, harvested that heat using the steam turbine, you would then be able to power the metal refinery and then some. Kind of similar is the kiln. Uh, this is a little bit cheaty because the kiln doesn't consume any power at all and generates uh, 20 kilo DTUs. Doesn't list that here, but whatever. Um, will generate 20 kilo DTUs as long as it's operational. So for just a little bit of duplicate labor to throw things in the kiln, you can generate heat for your system. That works as well. Um, you often pair the th steam turbine with other heat generating structures, maybe even the glass forge. That's a possibility, but thermo, thermo regulators and thermo aqua tuners as one of the, the big ones, and these will generate make cooling systems. In that sense, the steam turbine is almost used more as a way of cooling down your base than a way of powering your base. Uh, I have made a video showing off how you can generate sort of infinite heat uh, very easily using resources that are on every map um, and power just vast fields of steam turbines if you like. 
Um, I think Brothgar has a great video on using the metal refinery, setting that up, right? He's got his own build for using the metal refinery to generate power with a steam turbine. The downside there is that you can't operate a metal refinery constantly because you need ores to refine, but uh, that's neither here nor there. It's still a great video. But the steam turbine, excellent power source. Uh, there are ways to generate infinite amount of heat if you want to. And most importantly, it deletes heat, which makes it not just a good power source, but also one of the best ways of cooling down your base. Again, check out my videos if you're interested in seeing how. Uh, I've got great builds to show you on that stuff. Then finally, we have, for our power generation options, we have the solar panel. I think these are bad, personally. Um, I don't use them, but there are some really cool things you can do with them. Some standard use of a solar panel, what you do is you would set these things up in space where the light is really high and you need a lot of light to power these things. You can't just have like some lights that you build up here and have the thing power itself. It doesn't work that way. The solar panel needs light hitting it to work. Um, and it's not going to generate a ton of power, right? 380 watts of power for this large of a building, right? This is, this is seven tiles wide. Now, you can kind of increase how much power you're getting out of solar panels by kind of stacking them on top of each other, just having one little bit of it exposed to uh, light, right? So like you'll have one tile where there's nothing above it and then the next solar panel will be here and then the next solar panel, next solar panel, and just kind of like stagger them up diagonally and get a little bit more efficiency at the, out of the system. And these solar panels don't really require anything special to build, right? They're, they're pretty simple in that regard as well. Solar panel is just glass and not even that much of it, 200, right, for this gigantic building, which is kind of crazy. This whole thing takes 200 uh, kilograms of glass, whereas the steam turbine, uh, the steam turbine takes n not only uh, 800 kilograms of some refined metal, but 200 grams of plastic. So this this thing right here is is a one ton, and this is, is one fifth of that. I don't know, but anyways. Um, they might change that, might, they might not. But either way, this thing is really easy to build, but takes up a lot of space and takes up space that you kind of care about. It has to be at the top of the map, ex expose that sunlight. There is an interesting trick that you can do where if you stack enough shine bugs on top of a solar panel, uh, if you have like a shine bug ranching operation, you can do this. You can create a tile where all these shine bugs are powering solar panels. You can get really efficient stuff uh, going with that. But again, you're just you're talking about a lot of work for not a lot of power. Brothgar, again, uh, likewise has a great video. He did a video with the metal refinery and steam turbine. He has another great video on shine bugs and solar panels, which is really cool to check out. But the system just doesn't seem really that practical. It's a lot of effort to ranch, ranch these shine bugs for 380 watts of power, less than a manual generator. That's just not that's not really that attractive of an idea, right? Unless I really care about shine bugs for some other reason, like I want to get eggshells or something like that, or I want to use them for some sort of medicine or something, I'm probably not going with solar panels. And I care more about the amount of space that they take up at the top of the map than I do getting a little bit of power out. You also usually need something complicated because they need to have vision of space, but also meteors rain down from space. So you need to have some way of uh, leaving these a direct line of sight to space, but also having a way of blocking meteors and clearing up the stuff from meteors and uh, all sorts of headaches. I think this technology is bad. So a quick review of these. Um, necessary in the early game, but you want to transition away from these unless you literally are just using these to kind of train up your dupes. Terrible, really just used to generate CO2. That's really much it. I wouldn't use these otherwise. Excellent coal generator. You can use this all the way to late game if you want. Um, pair it with a smart battery for the efficiency. But uh, yeah, you can generate tons of coal and you don't need much of a ranching operation to keep these things going. Hydrogen generators, a lot of people say they're bad. I think they're good. I think you should use them in builds with electrolyzers, have a self-propelled design. It's just so much simpler. Natural gas, one of the premier technologies for power generation in the game because it generates so much polluted water and water is such a vital resource. And there are really cool ways of generating a lot of natural gas for you that, that don't just rely on natural gas vents. Petroleum generator, uh, good because it can generate polluted water from different sources until this thing starts accepting ethanol gas. This is the way that you consume ethanol for power. And uh, this is just really useful as a way of means of producing polluted water as a result. So kind of the same idea as the natural gas generator here. Steam turbine, 
Uh, uniquely good as a cooling option, fine as a power source, given that it's really not taking you anything in resources to keep it running. Um, really cool systems that you can set up with generate just as much heat as you could ever want and as much power, therefore, as you could ever want for your base. So if you, for some reason, have not enough heat in your base to use these steam turbines, I've got you covered. Check out my videos. I've got a great build for that sort of stuff. Solar panels, I think these are terrible. I wouldn't use them. Um, <laughs> there's some interesting kind of meme builds you can do with them, but uh, otherwise I'd stay away from them. And uh, before we continue, just a little bit of discussion of, of wiring. Um, so normal wires have a max wattage of 1000 watts. And as I mentioned before, um, that sort of calculation of whether or not they've exceeded that max wattage comes down to, um, to how much consumption is on the grid, right? Um, if you avoid keeping too much consumption on there and you build correctly with the generators, the, right, the batteries in between the generators and the consumers, then you shouldn't have too much of a problem. Um, conductive wires are made out of refined materials but will allow you to have twice the wattage on your grid. Um, so if you don't like the look of a bunch of smaller broken up grids, this is something that can have you have twice as many of those or half as many of those smaller broken up grids, right? You can consolidate some of them onto a single system. Um, heavy watt wire is sort of the next step up from that along with heavy watt conductive wire. Um, both of these can't run through walls. They need special heavy watt joint plates, right? So if I go to the power overlay, we see there's basically these power sockets that they produce on either side. You can flip these to make them vertical as well if you want. Um, but these are the sockets that you'll attach to your, your, your wires, right? Um, the ability, the inability to go through walls is really painful. And one of the big problems with these is the decor bonus is absolutely murderous. So if I look at um, the decor overlay, you know, all the rest of these things, some of them are ugly, some of them are good. People love shine bugs, for example. These things are terrible, right? The decor over this tile right here is negative 100 uh, because a duplicate here will, will be in range of three heavy watt wires and a heavy watt joint plate. And of course, if we took um, our power system here and just extended it out, right? If I had more wires going off here, this decor mouse is just gonna get even bigger. Negative 200, that's absolutely gigantic, right? Duplicates hate being around this stuff. Um, heavy watt conductive wire is a little bit better Right, if we go to the decor overlay again, um, yeah, negative uh, 48 for heavy watt conductive wire and negative 20 for the heavy watt conductive joint plate. So they like it a little bit less. The main thing here is duplicates just really don't like the look of these things. And that isn't that big of a dish, an issue, right? Morale is not that big of an issue in the game. It's pretty easy to meet your morale requirements and avoid duplicates from getting stressed from being around a bunch of really ugly things. But um, something to keep in mind, you're gonna have a hard time creating sort of you know, thermal locks that like you can't have. This metal, this this joint plate isn't going to be insulated. So if you have something hot here and something cold here, you're gonna have problems. Something to keep in mind for that. Um, but they do both have a max wattage of 20 kilowatts. So one kilowatt, two kilowatts, and then 20 kilowatts for these. Um, pretty excellent in that regard. They might change what these max wattages are, but if you, if you need, right, more power on a system, that's one way you can do it. Of course, um, one of the neat things you can do is use transformers. Transformers will um, basically s step you down in power. Um, so they will they will act sort of as a power consumer on one end, on the big end, and they'll act as a power producer on the other. And so you can take you know some, some line of heavy watt wire that's running a bunch of power through it and connect it to power transformers and then just have normal wire coming out of it, right? So if I looked at uh, power, wire, from this end I could just have some wire coming out like this but then, right, and just have a, like 1,000 watts of consumption on this end, uh, but then I could have heavy watt wire coming in to supply this, right? And this could supply a bunch of different transformers. I could have just basically what's called a power spine, where I have a bunch of my power generation, heavy watt wire connecting it up to a bunch of transformers, those transformers stepping down the power to safe amounts uh, for, for use in other places. Kind of useless is the large power transformer, um, because large power, the, the normal part power transformer will step things down to one kilowatt, so it'll be useful, usable by just normal wires. The large power transformer steps things down to four kilowatts. Um, there are some uses for these, but I just basically never build these, and I'll get to why in a little bit. But one of the main reasons is it steps it down to four kilowatts. That's still enough to overload these wires, right? So it's not super useful in that regard. These things kind of act like batteries as well, though, which makes them a little bit useful. Um, they also generate heat, much like batteries. So we go to power, um, the power transformer, right? Um, it 
produces one D, one kilo DTU of heat per second. Uh, large power transformer, same thing. Different power capacities. Again, this one is uh, four kilowatts. This one is one kilowatt. Um, pretty simple, pretty easy. And they work just like this, right? You, you have your high power stuff on one end, you have your low power stuff on the other one. You just make sure not to stack more than uh, 1,000 watts of power on this end and you won't brown out your system, right? But it will allow you to, to use this lower wire. This will basically kind of be considered like a separate grid, right, for you to manage once you've divided it up with these power transformers. Interestingly though, you have the option, and this is where we get to switched uh, capacitor, switched capacitor systems, switched battery systems. Um, you have the ability to create power transformers that can work at pretty much any power level you want and uh, don't really care about how much pow power you put into them as well. You don't need heavy watt wire for the system down here. And basically the way this works is that we're going to use power shutoffs in an automation system to uh, automatically disconnect our, our consumption side of things from our power generation side. And because um, of this feature of the game slash bug of the game where uh, the 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 max wattage whether or not you know it considers whether or not you've gone over that is only calculated by looking at the power consumption on the system as long as you keep the power consumption on the system separated uh, you can have any amount of power being powered just by normal wires through your power generation system so this is what this sort of thing might look like I have a ton of power generation down here as many watts as I want if I want to go up to you know a hundred kilowatts I can and I can just use normal wires for this and the trick is if we go to the power overlay here I have these power shutoffs set up so that at any given point in time either these two are off or these two are off and so this system all these all these consumers up here which i've just sort of shown by fridges are going to be on a separate power grid from this the consumers are never ever going to see anything on this grid right because it's only going to say this power grid extends from this wire here down to this wire right here right or if this is switched the other way it's going to be like this and basically the way the system works is we have a smart battery and a tiny battery or normal battery and we have our automation um, this might look a little bit complicated, but basically this battery right here, the smart battery, is sending a signal and says, if I have power, then I'm going to be the one that runs, right? And I want these uh, things to be on, and I want these things to be uh, off. And so I'm, I'm, all the power is going to go through me. I'm going to supply the power to these fridges. And if that isn't the case, right, uh, if I uh, am not sending off a power, uh, a power signal, and I actually just realized I got that reversed because it'll send the signal if it needs power, right? Um, but in either case, same idea, exact same idea, even though I just misspoke a little bit. Um, if, if this battery uh, isn't the one that wants to run, right, then it's going to send the signal that makes sure that this battery runs, right? So at any given point in time, only one of these batteries is going to be attached to this consumer network, and the other battery is going to be attached to this producer network. And whenever the battery attached to this consumer network is out of power, it's going to switch over and say, okay, uh, I want you to uh, power with the other battery. Um, it's not quite going to do that 100% of the time because uh, this battery could run out while this battery is still charging, and then the system will go offline. Um, you could fix that by having two smart batteries, but then you need a little more complicated of a logic system. But this is really neat and basic, right? Like I, it's literally just an automation wire from the battery linking up these two power shutoffs and then a not, a not gate, which is then linked up to these two ends right here. I just have a bridge kind of bridging over this part right here. And so you can have, right, you can, you can orient this different ways if you want. You can have the power coming in from here. You can have the power coming in from here. You can have the power going out a different direction. You just want to make sure basically that any given point in time, there is one battery attached to here and there is one battery attached to the power generation. And as far as these grids are concerned, all this power generation, all it sees is I'm charging this battery and there's no consumption on the thing. And all these things see is I'm hooked up to this battery and nothing else and I'm just draining it from it to consume things. The only limitation you have with this sort of switched capacitor system, of course, is that you still can't have more than um, the, the amount of consumption that you would have on this system, right? So if I look at the power needs here, I have seven fridges. Um, each of these fridges is 120 watts, so I only have 840 watts of consumption up here. That's fine because I'm using this normal wire, right? And so this normal wire will never overload because there's not enough consumption on the system, right? Um, if I wanted to have more consumers on the system, I need to use a higher grade of wire. 
more likely I would just have another one of these. But the big advantage of them is I don't need to step down power at any point and I can run any amount of power through my power generators, right? This can all be normal wire throughout, no problem. I can have just lines and lines and lines of coal generators, steam turbines, whatever. As long as they're hooked up to this, they can just run through this normal wire. So um, there is basically a transformer that operates better than these transformers. It takes a little bit of work to set up, right? You're going to need to actually kind of think to do it, but will then actually perform better than any of these transformers can um, because it, it completely eliminates the need for any sort of upgraded wire on the input side. And as long as you manage the, the outputs on this side, you can use whatever you wire you want and control however much power you want on that side. So um, really cool. Re a lot of interesting things you can do with these power systems. This is just sort of an example of one of them. But yeah, uh, that's the, uh, the rough rundown of everything. Hopefully this helps you in your games. I know this is a very long video, uh, but I wanted to review all the options. And if you're new to the game, hopefully this will help a lot. Um, again, sort of from the top. Manual generators, useful early game, right? Pair them up with a battery, power some of your early game stuff. Wood generators or wood burners, terrible. Only use them if you need to generate CO2 for like oxy ferns or something. Coal generators, fantastic. You're probably going to find a lot of coal on your map. Really easy to fuel these things. Really easy to renew the fuel using a hatch ranch. Hydrogen generators, a lot of people will, will downplay them. I recommend them. I think that they, they just make really neat compact builds in combination with electrolyzers. I don't think you should shy away from that or be shamed by expert players into saying, oh, that's a, it's a noob trap. I don't think it's a noob trap. I still think it's a good technology. Natural gas generators, one of your premier options will get even better if these are allowed to use ethanol gas as an input um, because there's just so many really cool ways of generating natural gas really efficiently and because they generate you polluted water. Petroleum generators are only are currently the only way you can consume ethanol. Ethanol you can potentially get for free by growing your lumber uh, with wild trees. Um, so this can generate you polluted water for free, which makes it, you know, again, like the natural gas generator, a good option. Again, this is the only advantage it really has over the natural gas generator right now because it's just kind of less efficient in every regard compared to the natural gas generator. Once you have some sort of sour gas condensation system, again, check out my videos to see that a design of that system. But um, for now, it's what consumes ethanol, which makes it a really cool option. Steam turbines, they delete heat, which is fantastic. Heat is one of the major sort of threats in the game. And uh, a power generation system that isn't generating heat for you is uh, really cool. This is going to be a very important way of managing the heat in your base. Check out my videos for steam turbine setups. Solar power, I think it's bad. Don't use it. These power transformers, I think they're bad. I would rather use something like this, which I think is really cool. Um, I can make a separate video on this if there's interest. Uh, these wires, main concern for them is whether or not they can go through walls and also uh, the decor malices they get. People don't like being next to wire. They don't mind being next to conductive wire at all. They're completely neutral about it. They really don't like being next to heavy watt wire. They kind of don't like being next to uh, heavy watt conductive wire. Keep that in mind when designing your base. And uh, there, there you have it. Complete rundown of all the power generation options currently in the game. And if you're watching this far into the future, then uh, go ahead and read the description to see if anything has changed between now and uh, wherever you're, whatever point in time you're playing this. Okay, that's it for this episode. I'll catch you guys next time.